Good afternoon, everyone, um, and thanks for sticking around because we have another um, great speaker uh, for the afternoon session. Um, it's my distinct honor to introduce our second speaker today, Peter Mandeville. Uh, Dr. Peter Mandeville is Professor of Government and Politics in the Shah School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. He's also a non-resident senior fellow in foreign policy studies at the Brookings Institution next door and an adjunct scholar at the Rand Corporation. Between 2015 and 16, he was a senior advisor in the Office of Religion and Global Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. U.S. State Department. Previous government experience includes serving as a member of former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's policy planning staff in 2011 and 12, where he helped shape the U.S. response to the Arab Spring. Peter was previously the founding director of the Center for Global Studies and also director of the Ali Vural Ak Center for Global Islamic Studies at George Mason University. His previous visiting affiliations have included American University, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and the Pew Research Center. His research focuses on the comparative study of religious authority and social movements in the Muslim world, with an emphasis on youth groups, transnational networks, and new media. Peter is the author of Islamic, I'm sorry, um, Peter is the author of, um, among other titles, Islam in Politics with Multiple Editions, which is a um, broad global overview of Islamic social and political movements. Global Political Islam with two editions and Transnational Muslim Politics, Reimagining the Ummah, um, which is a study of Muslim communities in the United Kingdom. He also is a co-editor of several volumes of essays in the fields of international relations and Islamic studies, including Politics from Afar, Transnational Diasporas and Networks. Uh, from Columbia University Press. Peter holds degrees from the University of St. Andrews and the University of, uh, and the University of Kent and has studied at the American University in Cairo. We are honored to have him here. Uh, please welcome Peter Mandeville. Thank you very much, Kadir, for the kind introduction. And um, I'm also very grateful to you for the invitation to um, address this, this conference, which is on a topic that is, have, has been of abiding interest to me for, for many years. And um, I just want to kind of mention up front uh, how important that I think the research that you've done with this project is and, and the sorts of gaps that it helps to begin to fill. Um, in the time that I have this afternoon, uh, there's essentially three things that I want to do. There was originally only one thing that I was going to do, but the hazard of going at the end is that you've sat through all the other presentations and you get ideas and there's things you want to respond to. So um, I, I, I will kind of deliver my official <laughs> remarks, uh, which is going to be something of a retrospective evaluation of where and how Islam has figured in U.S. foreign policy making over the years. Um, certainly, towards the end of the remarks, getting into some of the more practical and tactical questions with respect to governmental engagement with religious authority. Uh, you heard from my former colleague Sean Casey this morning uh, about the work, some of the work that we did in the Office of Religion and Global Affairs at the State Department. And I, I do want to kind of drill down in a little bit more detail on some of the points and questions that, that he raised in that context. Um, the two other things that I want to do briefly uh, are uh, be, because the question of Saudi Arabia and the ongoing discussion and processing of what Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman could possibly have meant when he said that Saudi Arabia is going to return to moderate Islam, um, and having, like Anel, just returned last night from Saudi Arabia myself, um, I can't, I can't resist um, kind of saying my little piece on that whole question. Uh, and then finally, in the vein of again, hopefully um, encouraging our good friends at the Luce Foundation to continue to support this work, I wanted to talk a little bit about some opportunities and avenues for future research, things that we uh, know that we don't know. Um, uh, to to hopefully kind of sketch out some ideas about what a future research agenda in this area looks like. I think it's fairly conventional to say that Islam became a subject of U.S. foreign policy um, in 1979 
with the Islamic Revolution in Iran. And by subject, I mean that was the moment at which Islam appeared to be a thing that US foreign policy had to contend with in a systematic uh, uh, fashion. Um, it is, of course, not in any sense the first time that Islam and considerations of Islam have figured in US foreign policy making. Um, you know, it's, it's possible, for example, to, you know, if you go back through declassified State Department cable traffic dating back to the 1930s and 40s, you can see uh, the U.S. Embassy in Egypt trying to kind of figure out what this thing, the M Muslim Brotherhood that Tariq Massoud talked about, what is it, how should the United States think about it? Um, certainly, and this is, I think, the, 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 the untold story, uh, at least untold in a systematic fashion, uh, where Islam fit into U.S. Cold War geopolitics. It is, it is certainly the case that the United States, during much of the Cold War, actually viewed Islam as a usable and useful thing, as a counterbalance, a countervailing force to the spread of global communism. Uh, and in that sense, um, you know, we talk a lot about Saudi Arabia's support for um, the export of Wahhabism around the world from the 1960s onwards, much of that activity was undertaken with the firm support, uh, encouragement, and in some cases direct collaboration uh, with the U.S. Uh, government, um, including some of its kind of covert arms. Um, so, for example, the Muslim World League, uh, one of the kind of leading parastatal uh, organizations responsible for Saudi-funded dawah over the last half, half century, uh, this is an organization that, amongst its many activities, supported the publications of Islamic magazines around the world, including in countries where socialist and communist parties and groups were trying to make head, headway. Um, and the U.S. Uh, government, I think, viewed those publications as a sort of very useful accessory uh, in its own broader Cold War policies. And so I think that's absolutely kind of something that we need to study and understand more about. 1979, as a year, is going to kind of figure uh, quite prominently in my remarks. Um, for those of us who study the intersection of Islam and politics, 1979 is, of course, one of these kind of watershed years, right? It's the year of Iran's Islamic Revolution, of course. It's the year of the Soviet invasion of, of, of Afghanistan. Uh, and just kind of telegraphing ahead somewhere that I'm going to go in, in, in a moment when we circle back to Saudi Arabia is, of course, the year of the Grand Mosque uh, seizure. And I think 1979 is useful because it precisely allows us to get a sense of this rather ambivalent Janus-faced approach that the United States took to Islam in its foreign policy. Because more or less simultaneously in the early 1980s, we have the United States uh, viewing Grand Ayatollah Khomeini uh, and the political Islam that he r represents um, as this enormous threat to U.S. interests and national security equities. At the same time, as the United States is beginning to fully and enthusiastically support um, a wide range of Islamic forces and causes that are converging on Afghanistan in order to push uh, the Soviets out of that, the, that country. So we have this sort of simultaneous, almost schizophrenic, political Islam is something bad and dangerous, and political Islam is something useful and u usable. And I would contend that in various ways, that, that tension uh, has continued to be present and to persist in U.S. foreign policy, even if the specific forms of it um, have, have, have changed. Um, really, you know, I, it's the post-9-11 period that, that I, I want to kind of leap to now. There, there's interesting detours that we can take, and I'm happy to kind of talk about it, if you want, later in our in the period that we have of, for open discussion of the evolution of U.S. policy towards um, Islamist movements, kind of more mainstream Islamist groups like the M M Muslim Brotherhood, because you know policy thinking in that regard has evolved enormously um, o over the years. But you know that's that's a that's a whole session or several unto itself. But because so many of our presentations this morning, I think did and Sean Casey's remarks did uh, kind of engage with the specific 
problematiques posed to U.S. foreign policy uh, by the aftermath of 9-11. That's where I want to kind of concentrate the next section of my uh, remarks. And, you know, it's very clear that, that, that the aftermath of 9-11 initiated this kind of new phase of sort of politics of good Islam and bad Islam, to use the framing of, of Mahmoud Mamdani's book. Um, the idea and a sort of bifurcation in U.S. geopolitical thinking of the idea that there are out there somewhere in the world, bad m Muslims, you know, broadly understood um, amongst those who kind of, uh, you know, the, the, those with more detailed and accurate in, in information uh, as, as a very specific uh, limited range of Salafi Jihadi movements, although in U.S. foreign policy discourse at the time, this is the sort of G.W. Bush administration, there were any number of groups that were working very hard, exerting enormous influence on U.S. foreign policy thinking to kind of convince American policymakers that Al-Qaeda and the Muslim Brotherhood are essentially the same thing. That any form of politicized Islam is, is something that inexorably leads to a worldview and behaviors that we had come to identify with Al-Qaeda and later ISIS, because we've seen a return to that dynamic around the rise of the Daesh. Um, and of course, the flip side of that was the idea that, well, maybe, and this is where we do start to get to questions of religious authority. It's the idea that there's these bad Muslims out there pumping you know, bad Islamic messages around the world through tendrils and networks and narratives. And so, you know, we need to identify the good Muslims that can sort of, you know, provide a counterbalance to, to that. And, and that, that, you know, that work was well underway, I think, most clearly embodied by the now rather infamous 2005 Rand Corporation report, Building Moderate Muslim Networks, you know, which was essentially a sort of full-throated endorsement of the idea that Sufis are cuddly and kind and peaceful, and if we were to undertake a robust effort to fund them and amplify their, amplify their voices, these Sufis are the ones that would be able to defeat the Salafi jihadis. Um, again, you know, for those of you who, who are versed in religion and Islam and these issues, you, you, know, you realize immediately how ridiculous of a proposition that is, but, but you know, these are the kinds of ideas that we're actually getting some level of, of, of traction um, in policymaking circles at, at the time. Um, this is also mid-2000s when we had the beginning of what I now like to refer to as declaration culture. Right? This is a series of, of efforts, sometimes with often with strong governmental support behind them to convene religious scholars to issue grand statements that affirm the moderate nature of Islam and reject the views and the motivations and agendas of the r r radical groups. Um, you know, so we have the Amman message, uh, we have the you know, a common word, um, you know, and, and we've had a whole series of these kinds of statements since that continue up to this present day. And I mention them because this sort of, this, this, the persistence of this declaration culture and this sort of tolerance symmetry phenomenon, um, you know, where we see every few months somewhere in the Gulf, religious leaders convene to kind of issue some statement about how there should be peace in the world. And the governments that then sponsor that use that to kind of show off their credentials as, you know, supporters of pluralistic, moderate, progressive approaches to religion even as they continue to bomb hospitals in Yemen. Um, so we have this sort of idea that there is hearts and minds and a war of ideas going on. Uh, you know, at the time of the George W. Bush administration, the, the sort of search for these moderate Muslims. And then comes the, Ob the Obama administration, the one that I served in. And, you know, you'll remember the sort of signature hallmark moment here being Obama's much vaunted speech in Cairo in the summer of 2009, subtitled A New Beginning with global Muslim communities, right? This was the sort of Muslim world version of the reset button, where the United States was going to um, declare a new way of engaging with Islam uh, in its conduct around the world. Um, you know, very deliberately and distinctly understood by those who were the makers of this approach 
uh, to be a, a direct kind of polar opposite to the previous George W. Bush administration's approach. And I think the sort of the, the sort of chief the sort of chief um, direction orientation of this new of this pivot, if you will is not found primarily in the Cairo speech itself. The Cairo speech is its most sort of detailed statement, but the kind of best encapsulation of it comes in a speech that Obama gives in Ankara, actually, to the Turkish National Assembly uh, in the spring of 2009, you know, which is mainly a speech about the importance of the US-Turkish bilateral relationship. But towards the end of the speech, Obama you know, you know, decides that he's gonna say something broader about Islam and the Muslim world. And he essentially says that from this moment forward, U.S. engagement with Islam and Muslims will cease to be about primarily terrorism and security and will instead be about partnership. The idea that Muslims and Americans should be working together to achieve great things in the realm of human development. So a lot of focus on the empowerment of women and education and research and entrepreneurship. All wonderful good things shall flow from this. And so then Obama gives the Cairo speech later in which he says in the first half of the speech some really ambitious and quite revolutionary things with respect to US foreign policy around the question of Iran, support for democracy in the Middle East, um, peace between Palestine and Israel, that really got a lot of people excited. You recall he was you know, awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, arguably essentially for that speech. Um, and I began to worry shortly after this speech was given um, about something that gave me a little bit of disquiet in the whole way that something called global Muslim communities were being framed and talked about as something that US foreign policy was suddenly becoming very interested in, even if, even if the sort of intentionality behind it, even if the, um, the kind of normative valence of this new American approach was positive, was about reaching out and embracing and hugging this global Muslim for collaboration and partnership. What gave me disquiet was the fact that for the first time, the United States was essentially constituting an entire world religion as a subject or an object of its foreign policy making. So one of the things that the US government did later that same year in 2009 is to create at the State Department a new position called the Special Representative to Muslim Communities. This is weird. This is bizarre. This is the first time in the history of US foreign policy that the US has appeared to appoint something like an ambassador to an entire world religion. Right? And, and consider for a moment what message is being sent by that move, by that gesture. The United States government is saying that at some level, there's a sense in which 1.7 billion people in the world are to be viewed, are to be engaged, are to be thought of primarily in relation to their religious identity. That it is somehow their religion that defines them. This is very worrying, right? This is essentially the US government projecting Muslimness of some sort onto a billion plus people who, yes, if asked about their religious affiliation, might identify as Muslim, but where the US government is telling them, for, for all intents and purposes in our policy making and programmatic initiatives, you are a Muslim, first and foremost. And I think what worried me about this is that the internal policy discussion of it was very much about trying to repair the damage of the Bush administration. And I sort of talked about is we need to normalize US relations with, with Muslims. To my mind, if you want to normalize relations with, with a particular community or group of people that feel that they've been stigmatized or singled out for a period of time, you normalize relations by treating them the way you treat everyone else. And the way the US usually treats um, non-US persons around the world is to regard them first and foremost through their their, their citizenship of a particular nation state. But no, in this sort of new ap approach, Senegalese, Indonesians, Turkish people, Jordanians have all become Muslim. They've been turned into Muslims in the US foreign policy gaze. And so what worried me about this is that even though, again, even though the intention behind it was to reach out, befriend, enable partnership and collaboration, 
there's an there was a weird sense in which the Obama administration's Muslim engagement efforts served to, I think, reproduce a version of the same exceptionalism that had characterized the Bush administration's approach to Islam, i.e. the idea that there's something about Muslims as distinct from other religious groups around the world that mean that they need their own special representative. They need their own Muslim-specific programming lines, right? And, 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 and so this, this, this sort of persistence to continually exceptionalize Islam and, and, and Muslims, which I think continues in various forms to this day, is very worrying to me. Um, a lot of these programs funded by the Obama administration's global Muslim engagement efforts, as I mentioned, focused on things like entrepreneurship, uh, educational development, and, and in a sense. And, um, I, you know, I, my, my, my concerns that I had with it, and I should, I should add in full disclosure that my concerns by this point were rather practical and operational in that one of the tasks I was handed upon entering onto duty at the State Department in January 2011 was to kind of oversee that whole basket of global Muslim engagement programs, which I looked at with utter horror and did everything I could to shut down. Um, writing what I thought were incredibly erudite policy memos about what was wrong with this and the sort of, you know, problems with projecting essentialized identities onto people. And that's, you know, that's, this is the learn, steep learning curve of an academic entering government that, you know, the, you know, reductionism, essentialism, and the projecting of identities onto people isn't terminology that works well in governmental circles. So I needed to kind of find other ways of trying to kind of explain what was wrong with this. And I think there were other ways that you could talk about what was wrong with it. One thing that was wrong with it, I thought actually, was that there's a sense in which the US government's embrace of a global Muslim engagement worldview actually at some level validated the narrative and worldview of Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, right? Because, because it, it, it would be very much the Al-Qaeda line and later the ISIS line that yes, these people are not primarily Senegalese or Jordanian or Indonesian. They are first and foremost Muslim. They need to regard themselves as part of an ummah and they need to be engaged with and connected with the global struggles of their co-religionists. And at some level, the United States in this approach was helping to enable that omatic identity, if you will, by kind of engaging in a new sort of global Muslim outreach effort. But I think from policy point of view, what was wrong with it, you know, can be best encapsulated by the conversation I had with the former colleague at the United States Agency for International Development, you know. And, you know, and he was going on and on about how, you know, we have these great, you know, Muslim engagement programs that are focused on fostering entrepreneurship in Turkey and Indonesia and Jordan. It's amazing work. And I said, you know, let me ask you something. We, the U.S. government, we, we fund and run small business development programs in Ecuador, right? He said, yeah, yeah, we absolutely do that. All right, I said to him, wouldn't it be weird if we called that work Christian engagement? After all, the population of Ecuador is 98% Christian. And he said, of course that would be weird. It, Christianity has nothing to do with religion. I said, well, why is it any less weird when we call those same programs Muslim engagement when we happen to run them in Muslim engagement, Muslim majority countries, right? What's, what's the unspoken assumption that's being made in that entire leap? So um, having told you what's wrong with the Bush administration's approach and told you what's wrong with the approach that the government I served in, the administration I served in, let, let me begin to kind of wind things down by kind of talking a little bit about my own experience of how US foreign policy making thought about figures of religious authority in the Muslim world in more recent years. Because my second stint at the State Department coincided directly with, and indeed I was brought to work, work in government precisely on the religious dimensions of the US approach to the rise of ISIS. And I think it's fair to say, and I also think I should say for the benefit of my governmental colleagues, it was fully understandable that in their mind, the idea is that we need to figure out, you know, how these religious leaders can be partnered with in order to discredit the religious 
messages and the, the religious interpretations being promoted by ISIS. And it was very clear that, you know, the, in, in, in the minds of most of my colleagues in government, religious authority figures were relevant insofar as they might be able to provide something akin to theological antidotes to Salafi jihadism. And again, we're kind of back to a version of the Bush administration's good Islam, bad Islam. That there's these bad ISIS messages being put out there about things that are supposedly in the Quran and Hadith that, that justify the extreme acts of violence and gratuitous murder and genocide, frankly, in northern Iraq that ISIS engages in. And so we need religious leaders who can clarify that those understandings of Islam are wrong. And so one of the things, the first things our office was asked to do, um, and I think Sean was a little bit more obliquely alluding to this, was to say, all right, we need a list from you, this new religion office. You guys are the religion experts, so tell us the religious leaders that we should engage and partner with who will be able to explain why ISIS is bad and incorrect and wrong in its understanding of Islam. And we were very wary of doing so. Um, for a broad, many reasons. Um, uh, there were, in short, very good substantive political and legal reasons why the US government needed to keep some distance from um, uh, appearing to support or endorse particular interpretations of, of Islam. I mean, not least of all, this thing called the US Constitution, where the First Amendment, the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, you know, specifically forbids the US government from taking positions on matters of religion. We can't endorse any particular interpretation of religion. And there were odd ways, I think, that we got close to doing so unwittingly at points. And this is where our office did on a couple of occasions kind of operate in high gear. You may recall that there were a couple of occasions at the sort of height of the US counter ISIL strategy where former Secretary of State Kerry referred to, uh, referred to ISIS as apostates. And we you know, had to pull them aside a couple of times and say, Mr. Secretary, you can't use that kind of language. Why not? Well, because for, for the U.S. government to label someone as an apostate suggests that the U.S. government has a position on what constitutes the boundaries of Islam, that we know who's in and who's out, right? It, that, that is effectively taking a position on a matter of religion, so we can't do that. Um, and I think there was some frustration because our office was very worried that, that you know, that we were being looked at, we were, we were being looked toward to give names and then these people on the list that we gave them would be funded, would be you know, flown around, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there was already a lot of this going on. There were certain figures that had stepped up in a big way to appear at US-sponsored countering violent extremism summits, um, you know, religious scholars of some considerable standing in, in kind of contemporary Islamic jurisprudence who had seemed to sign on big time to the emerging counterterrorism and countering violent extremism bandwagon that was gathering a head of steam in Washington, D.C. in 2015 and 2016. And, and I think that, that, that our offices, I think, well considered in the eyes of some failure to deliver on handing over the list of the right scholars to engage, um, you know, had some impact on how we were perceived because this was seen to be the foreign policy challenge of the day. And damn it, why aren't you religion experts telling us the um, Islamic leaders who will provide the antidote? Which is why, and here I think I'll echo something that Sean alluded to this morning, this idea that you know, I'm actually very glad that this research was not published while I was in government because I would have then had to engage in sort of, you know, the, the inside the State Department policy equivalent of street fighting with my colleagues in the counterterrorism and the counter messaging um, and the kind of public diplomacy and communications bureaus um, about no, 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 we, no, this does not mean that we should, you know, form a firm partnership with the Grand Sheikh of Al-Azhar uh, even though his numbers seem to be pretty good uh, in order to defeat ISIS. Oh, but this, this is research that shows that, and here are these lists, and you know, it, you know, our line would be, it doesn't work that way. That's not how it works. Um, and, and in that sense, 
I'm, I'm glad that this research didn't come out during the time that I was in government. Um, that, that said, um, I, I, I think this is incredibly important work um, for helping us to understand with greater spe specificity um, uh, you know, some of the more precise dimensions of what personalized religious authority looks like in the Muslim world. Because it's a conversation, certainly in the policy space, that tends to take place in very, very um, um, abstract fashion. Um, and this idea of sort of counter-narrative and counter-messaging and the idea that if we have these messaging centers and there's religious scholars whose views are being amplified by these messaging centers, that you kind of create a communications and discursive environment in the Muslim world that will, that will um, dilute uh, the appeal um, and, and render more inert the, the, the effectiveness of ISIS-type stories and me messages. And I just have to say that I, I'm very skeptical that, that religious authority operates in that way. And so this is where I'm, I'm, I'm going to put aside the kind of the Muhammad bin Salman return to moderate Islam stuff and, you know, happy to get into it if you want to do so during, during Q&A. But instead, I want to turn to, to by way of conclusion now, to um, kind of talk a little bit about where our scholarship and research around these issues might want to go in the uh, f f future. You know, when, when one uh, kind of gets at religious authority uh, through a list of, of, of names, what it doesn't tell us a lot about is um, the uses of religious authority. And I think we need to, rather than to assume that because someone carries the title of alim or sheikh or mufti, that, that they are in an authoritative position to determine how a particular individual understands and makes sense of his or her religious be 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 beliefs. I think, I, I think asking who questions about religious authority is an important step forward. And that's why I think this project has broken some important new ground. Going forward, I'd love to better understand, for example, questions around when is religious authority relevant? What are the circumstances under which the utterance of someone carrying one of these august eminent titles actually has an impact in the world? Um, I, I had this phenomenal opportunity in 2006 when the good folks at the Pew Research Center that were doing a lot of polling on, in the Muslim world at that point called me up and said, hey, uh, a question has just dropped out of our poll and the last minute for our next wave of global attitude survey in 44 countries, including 20 some Muslim majority countries, we have the opportunity to insert a new question that will be asked. And we'd like you to tell us what question you think should be asked, right? This is like a social scientist fantasy, right? The, the juggernaut of the Pew Research Center's global polling machinery being kind of offered to you to insert a question in. And I said, you know what? I would love to know something about these Muslims that you're polling. You know, w w when, they, when they want guidance in matters of religion, where do they turn? We don't know anything about that. So we inserted in the 2006 Pew Global Attitude Survey, you can find it, the reports are available online, we inserted a question that asked people in Muslim majority questions, and it just so happened in that, in that year, Pew was doing an oversample of Muslims in Europe, so we, we asked the question in some Muslim minority contexts as well, which produces an interesting comparison. We asked people, when you are seeking guidance in matters of religion, where, where, where do you turn? And we didn't name names. We gave people, we referenced certain kinds of spaces, certain types of sources. So the options I think we gave people were your friends and family, religious leaders in your local mosque or religious institution, national religious leaders affiliated with the state. So that's, that's, the, that's the official ulama that we've talked so much about today. Or finally, international figures that you access through satellite television or the in, I, internet. So I like waited, you know, kid, kid on Christmas for the results of this to come back. And there's one very clear pattern that, that occurred globally 
because this, these are questions being asked in South Asia, Central Asia, the Middle East, uh, Muslim majority sub-Saharan Africa. Um, what was very clear is that the vast majority of people when seeking guidance in matters of religion in 2006 turned to friends and family or religious leaders in their local institutions. National and official level religious leaders scored very poorly. And, and, and that's why some of the findings that came out of this study surprised me to some extent. And I have to say, and I think this is a very relevant finding that the study offers that does directly contravene some of the policy guidance that the religion office was offering our colleagues in government at that time, which was this idea that, that oh, we need to steer clear of these figures of official Islam who are simply viewed as mouthpieces of the government. They would never be credible voices you know, for uh, delivering the kinds of messages that the US government would want. Although the findings of this research would suggest that maybe we need to revisit that. I don't know. I'm still haunted at some level, though, by this idea that, I, I don't know, I, I just, I don't think that, I don't think that most Egyptians, when wanting to understand their religion, turn first and foremost to the likes of Shauke Alam or Ahmed al Tayyib as, as the person who sort of helps to steer them through their religious life. Um, this is not to say that those figures aren't relevant. And the fact that people endorse them does tell us something important and how they were endorsed and where those endorsements feature in relation to other sorts of figures, that is relevant information to, to have. And I guess what I'm saying is that as we go forward, I think we want to know more about what, what, what the sort of the uses of religious authority in the realm of everyday life looks like. Are people shaped by religious authority or are religious authority figures shaped by people? Right? To what extent do the figures we call religious authority figures in the Muslim world, and frankly in the Christian world, to what extent are they, are they um, responding to market forces, knowing that there are trends at work, and if they want to remain relevant and want to maintain some sense of legitimacy or popularity, they need to, to some extent, reflect where the market's at in the way that they talk and do religion. And finally, as a sort of trend that I noticed, and I, there was at least one of the speakers this morning that alluded to it, I think it was Buddy I'm actually talking about Iran, that I've noticed this trend as I kind of done, done comparative research around the Muslim world, particularly among young people, and this is connected to the kind of proliferation of social media and the, the wide range of sources that one has access to, has, has meant that, that you know, th there's been this, I think, fragmentation, frankly, if, if, if such a thing ever even did exist, of a sort of um, single pathway approach to religious authority, where one, you know, takes a single religious scholar or a single trend or madhab, if you want to get into questions of jurisprudence, and follows it. But rather a trend towards religious eclecticism. I want a little bit of this and a little bit of that. I like this scholar for this. I, oh, I like, I think that person's Quranic recitation is fantastic. And I like this person on questions of social justice. And I like what he has to say about that. And, and it's this sort of curation of a personalized religious experience that draws on a wide range of sources and a wide range of disparate sources. Some of them perhaps traditionally and classically trained Islamic scholars, but some of them figures like the sort of uh, the kind of Muslim Joel Austin, Am 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 Amr Khalid that, that, that Tariq referred to. And you know, you can talk about Aagim in, in Indonesia as the sort of, you know, I'm not sure if Am Amr Khalid is the Aagim of Egypt, or if Aagim is the Amr Khalid of Indonesia, but their, their mode of operation is essentially the same, a combination of self-help, 12-step programs, and pop psychology, so popular around the world with, with Islamic flavors and popular culture mixed into it, right? And so you get people combining in their religious experience, their day-to-day -day religious experience, a wide range of quote unquote religious authority sources, some of whom in theory are not supposed to work together very well. Right? So I like this Sufi figure for that thing. I like this Salafi figure for this other thing. I like this Muslim Brotherhood person about foreign policy. And it's all kind of mixed and matched and kind of it's this composite mosaic. Um, and it's engaged with in a sort of pragmatic fashion. 
Um, and, I, and I think that's sort of the trend. And if that's where we're going in religious life, uh, and again, this is not limited to the Muslim world. I think you could make a similar kind of comparative analysis with Christianity today. Um, I think that has profound imp implications for how we think about um, and engage with questions of uh, religious authority and how we understand it. Um, I've already spoken longer than I'd intended to, so I will wrap up now uh, and very much look forward to your, your thoughts and reactions and questions. But thank you very much. I'm Peter Humphrey, uh, Intel analyst and a former diplomat. I honestly think you're a little bit out to lunch on this. Um, by, by your logic, we should close down the embassy to the Vatican tomorrow morning, for example. Um, I imagine that the um, Mithrites have a huge resurgence in the Eastern Mediterranean. And the Mithrites, uh, they don't believe in collecting interest on loans, and, and they're really pretty hard on women. And if you ask a Mithrite what he is, the first thing he'll say is, I'm a Mithrite. He won't say, I'm a Roman Mithrite, or a Turkish Mithrite, or a Scythian Mithrite. He'll say, I'm a Mithrite. So if you want to establish policy that makes sense toward the Mithrite community, it would be nice to have somebody who's the Mithrite ambassador who knows these issues inside out and backwards so he doesn't try to do something stupid like establishing a micro-lending institution uh, in Mithrite communities um, or to send women preferentially to represent U.S. issues with the Mithrite community. And unless you have those sensitivities in one individual who can counsel the rest of the State Department, I think you're really out to lunch. Sorry. No, I actually think you're, in a roundabout way, completely endorsing the position that I, I offered for the following reason. I, I, and I, I would be the last person to suggest that we should shut down our, our, our diplomatic mission to the Holy See, not least of all because it's very conventional diplomacy. The Vatican is a sovereign state, and it's consistent with the US you know, tradition of having diplomatic representation at all sovereign en entities. Um, and obviously, as someone who enthusiastically le leapt at the opportunity to join an office focused on trying to help American diplomats better understand the role of religion in world affairs, I'm absolutely someone who believes that religion does matter. What worried me is when I began to see particular religions and followers of particular religions reduced to a little more than their religious identity and how US foreign policy thinks about and engages with them. So for example, when we were running the Muslim engagement programs, one, one, one of the first sort of confirmations of the uneasiness that I'd began to feel is when those entrepreneurship programs that we were running in places like Indonesia and Turkey, the participants in those programs began to come up to the State Department people on the sidelines of the events and said, look, you know, we really like the substance of this program because you know, we are business people here in central Anatolia and we're trying to like, you know, connect to um, small and medium enterprises elsewhere in the region of the world and these are useful skills, but you know, do we have to be labeled Muslims? before we can come into this space? Why can't we just you know, do this as entrepreneurship? Um, and, and, and people were absolutely pushing back against this tendency on the part of the US government to approach them through, label them by, and seemingly define them in relation to their religious identity. Be they, they, they didn't. I mean, if you ask them, you know, hey, you know, what's your religion? They, they would say, I'm Muslim. But, but my, my point is that their, their religion was irrelevant to that particular activity. They, 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 they would identify themselves as, as a Turkish b b businessman, I would guess, would be their, their first label. So I, I'm not saying that there aren't particular groups whose religious identity has pol been politicized in a way that would lead them first and foremost, to identify themselves primarily in relation to that. And we, we saw that uh, certainly around ISIS in no northern Iraq. And it is absolutely vitally important for us. And we did uh, think about and engage the circumstances around that in that. I'm, I'm just saying that 
I'm pushing back against the idea that it's helpful to approach 1.7 billion people around the world as if their Muslimness is the most relevant way to understand who they are and the things that motivate and drive their behavior. agree with a lot of what you said. Um, you know, so I am, given though that you did say all that, I am kind of surprised you did write that survey question, you know. So, in other words, what answer were you thinking you were going to get and what kind of policy would you want it to, let's say, for example, the answer you got was uh, that, you know, I turn to my official state, you know, person or I, you know, what kind of policy did you want to build on that question? Because then it does seem that you're endorsing the basic enterprise of this project. Yeah, no, I, I have a very ambivalent orientation towards this project because on the one hand, I'm like, I love it. This is awesome. This is my stuff. And then I'm like, oh, but you know, I'm not sure that a list of particular individuals is the best way to understand. Are really going to put Erdogan and Sheikh Moza on that list? Are they really religious authority figures? You know, aren't you just creating a popularity contest if you do it that way? You know, I, I talk. I didn't have in mind a particular policy um, um, outcome from that. I wasn't. I wasn't engaged as a policymaker at that point. I wasn't pu putting the question. I wasn't leaping at that opportunity with a policy use in mind. It, 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 I was leaping at it as a social scientist who, you know, as you, I don't, can't remember how you put, put it, you know, these models are great to use, just don't believe in them, you know. So when we got the data back, I knew there were enormous limitations, right? If you have to create, you have to reduce the possible sources of, you know, religious guidance to a, a you know, four ch choices on a multiple choice question, you're going to be... Um, you're you're going to be losing a lot of context and nuance, but you know that's part of the game that we play as social scientists. I, I, this was before the rise of social media, and so be, because one finding from that that I, I didn't relate uh, for purposes of brevity was that the one setting, global setting where there was clear um, where there was clear variation uh, related to Muslim minorities in Europe, where um, Accessing figures internationally through social, through internet and television was huge, particularly compared to local religious institutions and local religious leaders, quite simply, understandably, because there weren't as many. In a setting where Islam is not the ambient religion, th there isn't as ready access to mosques and local imams as there is in a Muslim majority country. So I would love to be able to do that again now and see. And I would probably. I mean, on, the second, on one hand, I'd be tempted to ask the question exactly the same way to have that longitudinal piece, but I think there are more nuanced ways that the choices could even be offered at present. So. Hi, uh, uh, Bill Primosh, uh, Montgomery College. I'm also, a, <coughs> excuse me, a former Foreign Service officer. Um, but you, I think this whole uh, conference underscored the importance of understanding uh, the impact of religious leaders and the need to understand the dynamics of religion in society and in politics, uh, I came away from your uh, presentation with kind of the feeling that, well, there's really nothing we can do as a government or as a foreign policy to influence these leaders. Uh, or it becomes counterproductive. I mean, based on your experience, what would you recommend in terms of engagement that would have some kind of influence, but not in a counterproductive way. So there are um, two or three elements in my mind to what a better approach and policy to these questions would be. One is to focus, uh, some of it is a, one of them is a data-driven finding based on that, that moment I had with Pew back in 2006, which would, which still, and I persist in still believing that, you know, Officially sanctioned, state-sanctioned religious institutions and leaders are not the best place to start when you're trying to understand how something like the quote-unquote average Muslim understands her or his religion and the implications of religion for conduct in everyday life. And that getting a better understanding of what religious authority at the local, district, provincial level looks like is important. And at that family level, and this is where the question of women comes in very, very importantly. Yes, 
just as in most major world religions, in Islam, it's generally not women who hold formal religious titles or hold positions in, in something like clerical hierarchies, but women in many Muslim-majority societies around the world are very influential shapers of how people engage with and understand uh, religion, even though they're not officially you know, um, uh, generally counted as uh, r r religious leaders. And I, I think there's, there's a whole world to that that we're only beginning to explore. But even if we are staying within the realm of people that hold something akin to formal religious titles in Islam, and it's different in Islam, right? Because there isn't sort of a central, at least in Sunni Islam, there is no centralized religious hierarchy. But to get a better sense of what kind of local, uh, provincial, and frankly, dissident national level religious leadership looks like. Not because the US government should then throw money at those people or amplify their voices. I can't, you know, what better way to spoil whatever legitimacy they might have than for the US government to hold them up and say, wow, this is great Islam. We need more of this kind of Islam. Perfect. Um, obviously, that's not the way to do it. That doesn't mean non-engagement. That doesn't mean U.S. abandonment of this space or these questions. It means that we use the leverage we have, use the diplomatic leverage we have in different ways. And so to my mind, that would mean, for example, in a bilateral military intelligence to military intelligence channel with the Egyptians, say to them, you know, you might want to lay off this person that you have a tendency to crack down on and oppress. Because even though you perceive that person as a threat to you, that person is actually playing, having a useful effect in terms of holding off groups that would be even more destabilizing, right? So it's a, it's a diplomatic uh, overture that is about trying to make space for certain voices and groups to be more influential without having to fund them and hold them up and give speeches about how amazing they are. It, it's, you know, it's a very subtle form of, of operation that U.S. foreign policy, which tends to either want to throw money or bombs at things that it finds in the world that, that we're not always very good at, but, but it, it's, it's, it's also something that our seasoned diplomats do know how to do very well. Um, and it's not easy, and it means sometimes having very difficult conversations, but I think it would be a more effective way than just trying to come up with a who's who list and funding or um, in, in endorsing particularly religious leaders officially. Thank you very much, Benjamin, to another diplomat. Uh, as opposed to the policy that the Obama administration, uh, the Bush administration before did of picking and choosing, <clears throat> uh, our policy, I think you're suggesting, and I would agree with, is talking to everyone and trying to understand and getting information and not have it picking winners and losers. Yes. Uh, covertly, we might do a little bit more uh, to advance our interests, but uh, for the most part, we would uh, be non-committal simply talking to everybody, including everybody. And one aspect of our policy that hasn't been touched on or our diplomatic practice is the uh, explaining our society yeah. and our values yes. and how we respect everybody's values, irrespective of whether they are believers or not believers, Muslims, Christians, and so on and so forth. And the second aspect would be exchanges, personnel exchanges, which we do a lot of, inviting people here to understand our society, meet with people of different communities, and so on and so forth, uh, plus uh, the Fulbright program, uh, sending people overseas to better understand these societies. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I am a, a huge fan of our public diplomacy programs and our international exchange programs. I think they continue to be just thinking purely as an economist, on re like, which I'm not, with respect to return on investment, 
I think what we get from those programs uh, is of enormous value over time. Um, and so I think they're very valuable. I think the, the idea of engaging with everyone is much to learn and at times to express points of disagreement rather than saying, I'm not going to talk to this group is the way forward. And, and you know, I, in, that, in that sort of engaging with everyone kind of approach, I, you know, Sean referenced, you know, Bill, Bill, Bill Burns, already the, the keeper of this August institution. Um, and one of my, one of my most valuable lessons as a amateur new diplomat, I learned from him, you know, he was undersecretary for political affairs the time that I started. Um, and one of the things, my, my main work when I worked on for secretary Clinton's policy planning staff was to kind of come up with a new post-2011, post-revolution approach to U.S. policy towards the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood, basically. That was the bread and butter of my work. And an opportunity appeared for the U.S. government to become part of a dialogue stream that had been going on for some years, whereby representatives of various European foreign ministries in a sort of academic, low-profile environment had been meeting with representatives of Islamist movements. And so a particular government that was involved in that came to us and said, would the, you know, in light of what's going on in the region, would the U.S. now like to join this dialogue? And I, you know, sort of thought this would be a great idea. Yes, of course, you know, it's clear in this new political landscape that's emerging in the Arab world that the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, is going to be a major player. We have had very little opportunity to meet with people like that, you know, despite the best efforts of people like Nathan, who, who, you know, even when that was impossible, found ways of creating environments where some engagement with Islamists could take place. I was all for it. And Bill Burns, you know, when I recommended this, said, no, we're not going to do it. And my default gut reaction to that was, oh, this guy, he doesn't understand. He thinks, you know, he thinks we couldn't be meeting with people like that. And, and when he explained it to me, I, you know, this is where it's like, oh, God, you know, who am I to think that I understand what's going on? He said, no, look, we have to assume that any meeting like that will appear on the front page of the New York Times. And anything in this sensitive environment in the Middle East right now, where the main thing we want to emphasize in U.S. foreign policy is that it is the people of the region who will decide their political futures. Any meeting where it looks like the U.S. government has already decided that it needs to have a summit with the Islamists will look like the U.S. has decided that this is the group that is going to win and we want to work with them. Um, you know, and so his point was, what we need is an approach to that kind of dialogue and, and a policy informing it that basically says the U.S. will meet with any group, regardless of its political stripe, regardless of what label is attached to it. You know, we did put some, that there were certain parameters that we put on it, um, you know, that, that you know, groups, you know, the, the group in question need to reject violence as a tool of achieving social change. They need to respect the, you know, the, the full rights of all citizens, including women and religious minorities. But other than that, we'll meet with anyone and, and with good reason, because in terms of U.S. engagement with the Middle East, with the Arab world, we had up to that point, those of you who have worked in, in Middle East diplomacy will know that most of our engagement with the region tended to occur almost exclusively with political, business, and military elites. We had very little contact with broader society. And in this new environment that appeared to be emerging, so hopefully in 2011, it suddenly looked as if a whole range of new groups and, 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 and um, ideological orientations were going to be relevant. So yes, the U.S. needed to meet with the Ikhwan, with the Muslim Brotherhood, and with Salafis, but we also needed to meet with leftists and social democrats and workers' movements that we also had neglected in our previous d d diplomacy. Yes, to learn from them how they see the country's future, and in some cases, including with some of the Islamists, as an opportunity to explain to them what concerns, what frank concerns we have uh, uh, about them. And so I, I just... I absolutely, you know, agree with that kind of broad framing of the challenge that we were faced with. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Don Anderson, uh, um, independent analyst. Okay. Full disclosure. XFSO also. At any rate, uh, um, <clears throat> sort of in the aftermath of what became 
um, known uh, in Egypt and the U.S. Uh, about our contacts, diplomatic, uh, etc., with uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, both prior to election of Mohammed Morsi and uh, in that period uh, when he sat on the throne. For that period of time, um, elaborate theories, conspiracy theories, uh, hey, uh, sprung up, and they're still out there. I mean, you know, that the U.S., in fact, engineered the uh, Muslim Brotherhood's takeover uh, in Egypt. Uh, some of us think that that's uh, um, quite often uh, regime sponsored uh, in the current context. Uh, um, we could talk about that. But in any case, what, what, what then is um, our uh, role in terms of uh, engagement? Uh, how do we engage with our own uh, intelligence, for example, in terms of knowing who's saying what and, and, and countering that? What are the possible avenues of, of, of approach? Can we get on talk shows where crazy stuff is going on? And uh, in fact, through not ourselves and our own spokespersons, uh, uh, State Department and others, but uh, locals that uh, um, actually are quite interested in countering uh, those kinds of statements, uh, conspiracy theories and uh, Others. I mean, uh, what would be our level of uh, engagement uh, and type uh, after that? And just one last thought. Thanks very much for your um, whole speech and uh, characterization of what a lot of us uh, have uh, felt that is that uh, profound discomfort in terms of some of the things we've said and places we've tried to go. Thanks. I mean, with respect to a country like Egypt and, frankly, U.S. policy in the Middle East more broadly, I, I think the United States just has to have a really kind of frank conversation with, with itself about what the north stars of its longer-term engagement with the region should be. Um, obviously guided by some assessment of U.S. national interest, and what I would contend is that the previous north stars that have been the guiding principles of U.S. diplomacy in the Middle East over the last 50 years have largely fallen away. And part of the turbulence that we're going through right now is that we, we're not entirely sure what our interests are. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the products of this is a knee-jerk reaction to scramble our way back to comfortable ways of doing business. And so... And there's a number of other countries in the region that are feeling the exact same thing. Saudi Arabia and Israel, perhaps chief among them. And this is why there's been this odd, you know, some people have kind of remarked, how, wow, why it suddenly seems like Riyadh and Tel Aviv, Riyadh and Jerusalem are such close buddy buddies these days. How is that possible? It's because they are experiencing a version of the same form of post-2011 shock. Both of those countries had become very comfortable with a staid, fashion of US engagement in business the region but but the 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 the, the correlates of US geopolitical conduct in the Middle East ha have have fallen away as the realities of the region have ev evolved um and and to me what this means going forward is that um you know before we think about you know, engaging in popular culture and ways to try and have certain kinds of influences, we need to have a clearer sense of, you know, what we're trying to achieve. Um, and, you know, I, I do agree as a someone who occasionally wears the hat of a conventional policymaker that security and stability is absolutely essential. But, but I believe that the way you achieve that, the way you get that, is to engage seriously in the long, difficult, one step forward, seven step back process of starting to take something like genuine political reform and participatory politics seriously. And you can give a democracy and human rights justification for doing that, that's fine, it's a good reason, but you can also give a damn good security and stability argument for doing so, with the idea that these societies will only be secure and stable over the long term if you make progress in enfranchising their populations and citizens, right? What we're seeing in Algeria, literally as we speak, you know, is, 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 I think, confirmation of something that many of us who monitor the region have been saying for years when things started to go bad after 2011. You know, and as some of our closest allies in, in the region, you know, countries like Saudi Arabia and the United Emirates double down on certain kinds of policy, uh, you know, positions, 
the ones that this administration has been only too happy to enable, um, and I think thinks itself to be in control of things that it's not in control of. I mean, the, 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 the Trump administration. I think the Trump administration is being played by the Emiratis and the Saudis just, you know, to no end. Um, and, and so, you know, what's happening in Algeria is a confirmation of this idea that, look, given where we've ended up, it's only a finite amount of time before the, the, the forces that produce 2011 come back again, because the same basic social contradictions that produce those events are still present. You know? And if so, if we're going to go through this again ever so often, and if there's diminishing returns on it, meaning that the state has to use ever greater amounts of regulation, enforcement, and violence, we're just going to create a cycle of instability and insecurity. Um, and, and so, you know, this is why I think it's time for a kind of a broader strategic reevaluation of our. So, I, you know, I'd, I'd say, <laughs> I, in a sense, this is a cop out because I don't have good answers for the, you know, what should we be doing now in terms of the day to day influencing of popular opinion. But I think we shouldn't be doing that until we get a, a better sense of where we think things need, need to be going in a more strategic fashion. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here um, all day. Um, I want to thank Carnegie Endowment, um, Nathan, Sarah, and other staff for hosting us here. Um, and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.